Hi, welcome to Digging to China. I'm Dong Xiong. Thank you for tuning in. Your support means the world and plays a crucial role in the YouTube algorithm. Liking, sharing, and subscribing not only show your support, but also help YouTube recommend my videos to a broader audience. Thank you very much. It's likely that everyone has seen the encouraging report released by the Chinese government, a 5.3% GDP growth rate for the first quarter of this year surpassing all expectations. Upon seeing this figure, many of us probably shared a common skepticism. Given our familiarity with the National Bureau of Statistics over the years, it's almost certain that there is some degree of manipulation in these numbers. The only question is the extent of it, whether it's more or less than usual. The National Bureau of Statistics operates differently from the central bank. Its data trickles up through various levels of reporting, starting from the local level and ending up in Beijing. At each stage, there is a potential for manipulation as officials strive to maintain a positive image. Beijing is aware of this potential padding and adjusts the figures accordingly. They can't afford to be too extreme. If all the regional figures were simply added up, showing a 10% GDP growth for the first quarter, it would be unbelievable. Hence, the reported GDP growth of 5.3% seems more reasonable. However, even though it may not be outrageous, there are still logical inconsistencies. In this video, we'll delve into the flaws revealed by the National Bureau of Statistics, providing some lighthearted analysis. Firstly, it's important to understand how China calculates its GDP. China uses the production method, which means it includes all goods and services produced within its borders in the GDP calculation. To simplify, Let's say I'm Dong and I own a denim jeans factory. In the first quarter of this year, my factory produced 100,000 pairs of jeans. However, only 10,000 pairs were sold, leaving 90,000 pairs in inventory, a significant surplus in production capacity. However, for GDP purposes, all 100,000 pairs of jeans produced are counted. Whether I sell a lot or a little doesn't affect the GDP calculation. In a typical market economy, if I perceive low demand for jeans, I might scale back production, resulting in a smaller GDP contribution. That's how market dynamics operate. However, the scenario could unfold differently in China. Picture this. One day, Xi Jinping calls me and says, Don, you need to think about a bigger picture. Despite the current weak domestic demand, you should ramp up the denim jeans production, expand your factory, invest in more equipment, and hire more workers. Short on funds? No problem. I have arranged for Industrial and Commercial Bank of China to provide you with an interest-free loan of 10 million. Take advantage of it. Hearing this offer, I'd be inclined to help and increase denim jeans production to contribute to the national GDP. Don't dismiss my story as exaggerated. Just take a look at the GDP growth in China for the first quarter of this year. Isn't it predominantly propelled by a remarkable surge in the secondary industry? According to statistics from the National Bureau of Statistics, the growth rates for the first quarter GDP are as follows. The primary industry expanded by 3.3%, the secondary industry by 6%, and the tertiary industry by 5%. This clearly indicates that the first quarter GDP growth is predominantly upheld by the secondary industry. And what does the secondary industry encompass? Isn't it primarily manufacturing? During the first quarter, there was a 6.1% year-on-year increase in the value added by industrial enterprises nationwide, with manufacturing growing by 6.7% and high-tech manufacturing by 7.5%. Looking at the specific products, electric vehicle charging stations saw a 41.7% uh, surge, 3D printing equipment increased by 40.6%, and electronic component products rose by 39.5%. This indicates that numerous companies have indeed heeded the party's call and expanded their production. 
There is a further evidence in investment trends. Where did the national fixed asset investment flow in the first quarter? It overwhelmingly favored the secondary industry. Investment in the primary sector saw a modest 1% increase, while the tertiary sector grew by 0.8%. In contrast, investment in the secondary sector skyrocketed by 13.4%. This expansion in manufacturing led to increased production, generating a significant contribution to the nation's GDP. So here is the question. With manufacturing ramping up investment and boosting output, did the produced goods end up in warehouses or were they all sold? This hinges on consumption and export data, doesn't it? Goods manufactured by factories are either sold domestically or exported. The, the, those are the primary outlets. However, in the first quarter, the total retail sales of consumer goods only saw a modest 4.7% year-on-year increase. We'll delve deeper into the consumption issue later. But for now, let's conclude. Domestic consumption isn't exactly robust. After all, China is still grappling with deflation and subdued domestic demand. There is no denying that. So what about exports? They don't seem particularly strong either. In March, exports unexpectedly dropped by 7.5%. With both domestic and foreign demand subdued, do you think factories expanding production will lead to a surge in inventories? Let's consider, is the expansion of manufacturing production a spontaneous action in line with market economic principles, or is it driven by government intervention? If Xi Jinping hadn't called me to contribute to the country's GDP, my denim jeans sales would have been low, and I definitely wouldn't have increased the production, maybe even reducing it. But since Xi Jinping personally called and arranged for the bank to provide me with an interest-free loan, I'll help produce more. This is an increase in production under government intervention. Here is an interesting point to point. Originally, the Communist Party set a 5% economic growth target for this year. Yet, in the first quarter alone, it already surpassed expectations, reaching 5.3%. What does this tell us? It suggests that the economy is thriving, doesn't it? There is no urgent need for additional stimulus. Fiscal policies can relax, and there is no necessity to fuss over equipment upgrades or schemes like trading old for new anymore, is there? If the economy were indeed performing exceptionally well, we might anticipate the Communist Party refraining from implementing additional economic stimulus measures, given their initial success. However, the reality doesn't align with this expectation. This year, we still anticipate the central bank to reduce reserve requirements and interest rates, while fiscal policies continue to stimulate the economy. Why? It's because there is some inflation in this GDP figure. Apart from the inaccuracies in the reported numbers from lower levels, the most significant inflation in China's GDP stems from the narrative I just described. Not all GDP is productive. Some of it is harmful and it doesn't add to societal wealth. For example, if a factory churns out excess denim jeans that sit unsold, it merely inflates GDP without generating profit for the factory. It's like Xi Jinping impulsively erecting an office building in Beijing, then tearing it down and rebuilding it multiple times due to dissatisfaction. Each construction cycle adds to GDP, but it's all considered garbage GDP. That's why I've consistently emphasized that the GDP can be artificially inflated. For example, in China, buildings typically need rebuilding every 30 years due to poor quality, whereas in other countries, they can last 300 years without issues. This means no matter how hard other countries try, their GDP won't surpass China's. However, does this automatically mean China's economy is superior? Not necessarily. Thus, comparing countries solely based on GDP is meaningless. Only the Communist Party touts such inflated figures. Internationally, there has been a decade-long reflection on GDP obsession because a high GDP doesn't necessarily translate to a higher happiness index for a nation's people. China exemplifies this well. 
Let's crunch some numbers. The GDP cake is divided among the government, enterprise, and the residents. So how much did each Chinese resident receive this year? According to data from the National Bureau of Statistics, the average disposable income per capita in the first quarter was 11,539 yuan. Multiplying this by the population of 1.4 billion, we get a GDP share of 161.5 trillion yuan. However, the total GDP for the first quarter was 296.3 trillion yuan. Calculating the percentage, we find it's 54%. Now let's compare this to the United States, where disposable income per capita share in GDP exceeds 70%. So do you think the average Chinese person is being exploited? Remember, disposable income includes not only wages but also other forms of property income such as the stock market profits and the dividends from company shares. Therefore, if we only consider labor compensation, Chinese workers' wages as a share of GDP will definitely not exceed 54%. While it might appear that the average person receives a substantial portion of the GDP cake, we mustn't overlook China's significant wealth gap issues. This is why many feel puzzled. Despite the seemingly high labor compensation in GDP, their own wages remain low. Why? Because while some individuals earn millions or even billions annually, others struggle to make ends meet on much less. Those seated in the Great Hall of the People are often millionaires or billionaires, while many ordinary citizens worry about meeting basic financial needs, perhaps even uncertain about earning a mere 100,000 yuan this year. I haven't addressed yet how implausible the per capita disposable income figures reported by the National Bureau of Statistics are. After examining the data, it's clear that the tax records from the Ministry of Finance don't align with the purported growth in per capita disposable income. These statistics are highly suspect because they originate from local reports rather than being derived from the tax system, making them little more than arbitrary figures. Additionally, the figures released by the National Bureau of Statistics this year are more exaggerated than in previous years. The Bureau informs us that the median per capita disposable income nationwide is 9,462 yuan, showing a nominal growth of 6.4% year on year. What does this mean? It indicates that the median income growth rate exceeds the average income growth rate, suggesting a reduction in China's wealth gap. Furthermore, the Bureau also states that the nominal growth rate of average wage income per capita is 6.8%, surpassing the GDP growth rate. So, why do so many people still complain about declining income? Could it be due to their lack of diligence or insufficient effort at work? In the world, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, wages are on the rise, the wealth gap is shrinking, and the consumer spending is growing. In the first quarter, the average per capita consumer spending nationwide reached 7,300 yuan, marking an 8.3% increase compared to the same period last year. Without this information from the Statistics Bureau, one might not have realized the extent of Chinese consumer spending habits. So, why then does the domestic market continue to offer various discounts and promotions? Why does the producer price index PPI remain negative? And why does the Communist Party acknowledge issues with domestic demand, prompting the need for stimulus? According to the National Bureau of Statistics, China's economic landscape appears quite rosy. High economic growth, low inflation, declining unemployment rates, expanding manufacturing, rising incomes for ordinary citizens, and increasing consumption. What's more, the rate of consumption growth even outpace that of income growth. If all these indicators hold true, China's economy seems to be in excellent shape without any need for stimulus measures. Concerns about deflation appear exaggerated, as there is evident consumer appetite. 
President Xi Jinping should consider sharing China's successful economic model with the world, highlighting its achievements in achieving low inflation, robust growth, higher incomes, reduced unemployment, and heightened happiness indices. It's also crucial to discreetly maintain the A share market around the 3,000 points to avoid drawing undue attention to China's economic prowess. I sincerely hope President Xi Jinping will elaborate on these experiences in his forthcoming book, offering valuable insights for global economic development. Thank you for watching. Please like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.